Welcome to World War II Indiana Landmarks, Episode 26, the LST-325 Ship Memorial in Evansville. I'm your host, Ron May, author of the book, World War II Indiana Landmarks. A piece of World War II Navy history rests at a pier along the Ohio River in downtown Evansville, Indiana. Floating on the murky brown water, the gray steel structure carries the designation LST-325. LST, an acronym for Landing Ship Tank, was one of the Navy's amphibious cargo ships. Its design first appeared early in World War II. The Navy developed many different amphibious ships for World War II service. All of them began with the letter L for landing. Landing craft, LC, were smaller, and landing ships, LS, were larger. LSTs were the largest of the amphibious inventory. The Evansville Shipyard, the largest of the Midwest cornfield shipyards, produced 167 landing ship tanks at the 45-acre site along the banks of the Ohio River. Almost 20,000 workers were employed there. At its peak of operation, the shipyard was turning out an LST in 60 days. LSTs were 328 feet long and 50 feet wide, and were large enough to carry a crew of 117 officers and enlisted men, and a complement of 163 landing troops. The cavernous tank deck inside the cargo hold carried up to 20 Sherman tanks, or 39 light Stewart tanks, or 17 Amtraks. Based on a design by naval architect John C. Niedermayer, who worked for the Navy's Bureau of Ships, the LST was made with a flat bottom instead of a keel, which allowed the ship to move in as little as four feet of water. A sophisticated ballast system brought seawater into tanks on the ship, which forced the ship down lower in the water for stabilization in crossing the open sea. As the ship approached land, the water was pumped out of the seawater holding tanks, raising the ship so that it could get close to land. After the tide went out, the ship, with its flat bottom, could rest on dry ground for unloading. Once at her desired location, the ship's crew opened her massive bow doors and lowered the ramp. The tanks and other vehicles were then driven down the ramp and onto the beach. Their transport across the water completed, the tanks were then driven to the war front. Lighter vehicles like trucks and trailers were packed in tightly on the weather deck above the cargo hold and secured with cables attached to tie-downs on the ship's deck. LSTs were able to carry up to 40 military vehicles to an invasion beach. Following the unloading of vehicles and men, the ship moved back out to sea pulled by a steel cable attached at one end to the anchor on the sea floor and the other end to a winch located in the stern of the ship. The anchor was initially lowered while the ship was still in deep water and approaching land. The anchor cable was then extended, allowing the ship to continue its movement toward land. Once the ship was unloaded and ready to head back to sea, the winch rolled up the cable and pulled the ship backwards until it was in water deep enough to raise the anchor and move under normal power. For those occasions when the LST could not make a beach landing, smaller landing crafts, LCVPs, were used to move men and equipment to the shore. The LCVPs hung from the top sides of the ship by davits located at the back of the ship. When it was time for their use, the LCVPs were then lowered into the water and transported landing forces and other equipment when it was too dangerous for the LST to beach on the shore. LSTs were also used on their return trips to transport the wounded back to hospitals in England. By September 28, 1944, LSTs had brought over 41,000 men back across the English Channel from Normandy. The genius of the flat-bottom design of the LST, so necessary for its landing missions, had its curse as well. 
Instead of cutting through the water, the flat bottom ship slapped the water as it moved across the ocean. It was a rough and dangerous ride for the crew. Having a top speed of only 10 miles per hour, or 11.6 knots, it lacked the speed to outrun an attack from enemy ships. The flat bottom design and lack of speed resulted in many of the ship's crew referring to their LSTs as large, slow targets. Perhaps because they believed so many of the ships would be lost in battle, the Navy didn't even bother to give names to the LSTs, only numbers. Ironically, of the over 1,000 LSTs made, only 26 of the ships were sunk. That it was considered a disposable ship did not take anything away from its importance, especially to the men who served on her. Native Hoosier Robert Patterson was one of those sailors. Patterson was born in 1925 in Lindsburg, Indiana, a small town 10 miles southeast of Crawfordsville. After graduating from Waveland High School in 1943, he enlisted in the Navy. Following his training, Patterson was assigned as a cook on LST 1078. The brand new ship had been commissioned on May 15, 1945. She then departed New York City in June and headed to Pearl Harbor. By the end of August, the ship left Pearl Harbor on orders to take on Army troops for occupation duty in Japan. After reaching Japan, Patterson rode the Slap Happy ship to the Philippines, as well as the islands of Guam, Saipan, and Tinian, before finally making it back to Pearl Harbor. He was honorably discharged in October of 1946. LST 325 the ship that eventually found its way to Evansville, was just one of 1,051 similar ships made for the Navy during World War II. She was built in the Navy shipyard in Philadelphia and launched on October 27, 1942. She was commissioned for naval service on February 1, 1943. Following her shakedown cruise, LST-325 sailed to Oran, Algeria in March 1943. For three months, the crew practiced loading and beaching operations in preparation for the upcoming invasion of Sicily. LST-325 made multiple landings in Sicily and then proceeded to Salerno, Italy for another amphibious landing. By Thanksgiving 1943, the ship arrived in Plymouth, England to prepare for the upcoming invasion of Normandy. On June 5, 1944, LST-325 left Falmouth, England, one of 300 such ships, with elements of the Army's 5th Special Engineer Brigade and headed for Omaha Beach in Normandy. As part of Task Force B, she carried backup forces for the initial waves of troops going ashore. On June 7, LST-325 set anchor and unloaded her troops and vehicles into smaller personnel craft for their final transport to the beach. During the next 11 months, from June 1944 through April 1945, LST-325 traversed the English Channel 43 times, bringing both forces and equipment. During those trips, she unloaded both troops and vehicles at Omaha, Utah, Gold, and Juneau beaches in Normandy. In late December 1944, she engaged in rescue operations for over 700 men of troop transport Empire Javelin that had been damaged by torpedoes off the coast of France. Following the end of the war in Europe, LST-325 departed in convoy for the United States on May 12, 1945. Caught in a major storm, a massive wave struck her bow causing a critical crack across the main deck and threatened the ship. The ship's fitters welded plates across the hull which saved the ship and allowed her to continue her journey homeward. She arrived in Norfolk, Virginia on May 31, 1945 
and then proceeded to the shipyard in New Orleans for necessary repairs. She was on a shakedown cruise in August when Japan surrendered, bringing World War II to an end. LST-325 was reactivated three times in succeeding years, once during the Korean War, delivering troops and vehicles there, and twice during the Vietnam War, prefer performing the same missions, before she was decommissioned by the U.S. Navy for the last time in 1963. In May 1964, the ship was purchased by Greece and transferred to the Greek Navy. She was given a new name, Syros, and a new hull number, L-144. She served for the next 35 years with the Greek Navy. In 1999, the ship was deactivated for the fifth time in her life. She would have been mothballed if it had not been for a chance discovery of the ship by a veteran U.S. sailor who had once served on LSTs during World War II. Ed Strobel was visiting friends in Greece in 1995 when he learned of that government's decision to mothball the old LST ships that had been acquired from the United States. Strobel was a member of the LST Association back home in Decatur, Illinois. The association consisted of 10,000 former crew members of LST ships who wanted to preserve the history of that ship's service. The organization was interested in locating an LST to turn it into a memorial ship and national museum. That effort, however, had proven difficult, as the United States had not kept any of the LSTs used in World War II or Korea. All of them had been either mothballed, sold, or given away to other countries. LST-325, or Cirrus, was the one selected of the seven former U.S. LST ships that Greece owned. The USS LST Ship Memorial Incorporated acquired the ship in 2000 and prepared to bring her back to the United States with an all-volunteer crew consisting of former Navy sailors who had once served on LSTs dur during World War II in Korea. The men, most of whom were in their 70s at the time, paid their own way to Greece and pitched in for supplies. They also endured a 100 degree heat on board the ship during the voyage. After receiving necessary repairs, in 2005 the ship traveled up the east coast of the United States and stopped in several port cities before finally arriving at her new home port in Evansville, Indiana. The city warmly welcomed the ship and adopted her as their own. Except for short cruises every fall, she has remained there ever since. Today, LST-325 is one of only two existing World War II LST ships in the United States. The other remaining ship, LST-393, is in Muskegon, Michigan, and also serves as a museum. Of the two, LST-325 is the only fully operational ship. She is used each June for a simulated amphibious invasion along the Ohio River during Evansville's annual Shriners Freedom Fest. And every September, the ship travels up a river or across a coastline to allow more people to view her and learn of her and her crew's proud heritage of service in combat. The ship has also appeared in several videos and movies, its most important function, however, is as a museum for that class of ship and a memorial for the men who once served on them. The ship is in port 11 months of the year at her home along the Ohio River in Evansville and is open for tours. The visitor center at the docking facility traces the history of the ship with exhibits and information. Knowledgeable guides take visitors throughout the ship and show them her unique design and special equipment that allowed her to land vehicles and troops ashore. Visitors to the ship museum can walk across the ship's decks, view the guns that once protected her, and descend into the tank hold cargo area where tanks were once transported. There are many displays to be viewed on this deck of the ship.
Here, visitors will see service-dressed mannequins depicting life on the ship and its mission to land forces, vehicles, and equipment. While walking through the ship, the visitors will also see the troop birthing areas and see how soldiers had to squeeze into their racks. Visitors will also enjoy the view from the bow doors that open to a glorious view of the Ohio River. World War II history is afloat in Indiana, and it is well worth seeing the historic ship and walking her historic decks, which once carried men, vehicles, and equipment to the beachfronts during World War II. Visit lstmemorial.org for more information. Learn more about LST-325 and those who served on her in my new book, World War II Indiana Landmarks, available for purchase on my website or wherever books are sold. And while on my website, check out my trilogy of Indiana World War II service stories. Thanks for tuning in to this episode.